Brewster Kale, you've probably not heard of him. He's an eccentric uh, entrepreneur who's just collecting one copy of every book ever written. Paper, <laughs> hard copy. To hell with the computer. So I wrote, in praise of Brewster Kale. Brewster Kale, I think I'm in love with you. Your toothy smile, receding hairline, middle-aged paunch. The way your hands extend out and up from your elbow might, in other circles, be mistaken for jazz hands. The way, even with closed lips, you always look like you are about to say something important. Maybe it is your orange shirt, the striped one, or the welcoming angle of your head, or maybe it is your books. When the apocalypse comes, after the great fire dies, I am going to push open my blast door and point my compass towards your books. When the end has come and gone again, we will need to start at the beginning. I will be the troubadour singing the words you herded to an empty field. From the ashes, those who have forgotten how to speak will gather. Once upon a time, and quiet as it's kept, there may be no marigolds, but there will be stories of giants and whales, straw spun to gold, long voyages home of children unknown, of madness and kindness, falseness, divineness, of loss and betrayal, of Cain and of Abel, of battles and grails, of great fish and sails, of mothers and daughters, long fought for borders, of poets and pixies, lovers and tricksters, elegant presidents, innocents, decadents, sing on, jazz, paunch, teeth, moxie, Mr. Kale. <laughs> Hometown. This was the library, of course, discovered like Columbus discovered America. Quite like that. Here always and yet a pleasant surprise when found by foreigners who neither read nor lie by window box. This was the Red Store, so named for its paint color by a Wobegon grocer with four and a half parking spots to atone for its shambled shutters against which Teenagers in their lust and with no place to go, groped clothes, not theirs, and being worn by another. Then houses, homes, where babies slept, or not, rooted at their mother's breast, toddled and pushed hairpins into electric sockets, pulled dog tails, fussed, wailed like they knew the world would never fill their pockets. There, the devout walked dressed for God, sin hiding in their skirts or waiting to be unearthed or birthed or left in the lurch or searched with fine fingertips to know at last that they exist. Now ain't that rich? <laughs> Playing doctor. <laughs> Why is it always the girl child who is the patient? <laughs> it is never pull down your pants, look left, and cough while her hand cups his balls. It is the long, slow unzipping of her footed pajamas. No laughing, she says. This is serious business. This seeing of the unseeable. A woman's body even in girlhood, requires exploration, perhaps a map or two. One for its caves, another for its climate. <laughs> Inherently, boys and girls understand the female form invites knowing, and yes, documenting. So, in the name of cartography, she flattens her back on the desk, points her toes, and waits to see if California is still an island. <laughs> Thanks, that's a fun one. <laughs> this one, not so much. Year four. Not still born or born still, but breathing, small and doomed. With three pounds to share between them, he took just one for himself and all the death, left his baby brother heir 
and a fighting pair of lungs. Small solace, they are together now. Nobody wants to know that you spent Thursday night on the kitchen floor propped against the freezer, or that there remains one package of breast milk buried beneath the freezer burn, or that your first decision as a mother was to hold your firstborn as he died. Nobody wants to know that you told his twin to go with him, whispered your goodbye, and brought no babies home from the hospital. Years pass, four birthdays, four Mother's Days, a thousand Mondays, and every morning finds you swimming up for air. Sometimes you get up, get dressed, and pretend. Sometimes you get down on your knees in the backyard and dig in the soil for what might have been. Wow. Yeah. Coda. In this version of the story, Ryan Thomas doesn't die. He is small and scared, but he does not die. In his father's hands, he breathes one steady breath after another, and the world continues to spin. His grandmother buys rattles instead of rosaries, pacifiers instead of prayers. In this version of the story, there are balloons and report cards, growth mar marked on the door jam, first dances, skin knees, thunderstorms, two-wheelers, saxophone solos, messy rooms, slam doors, and first love. In this version of the story, Ryan Thomas takes his very last breath at the end of his very long life rewrite the story so he takes his last breath next month next monday or tomorrow wow. thank you barry manilow fans out there i thought i might have the age right for this room copa <laughs> She is the only girl in class with a flower in her hair. And though it is not yellow nor feathered, I see Lola in her prime, before Rico. I see the smoke in Lola's cha-cha, which is different in the hips from the rumba she does for Tony on the empty dance floor. This girl is not Lola. She is nine and wrapped, watching her teacher's colored pencil stutter step across the paper. The music is in her head and fingertips waiting and waiting. The flower, black and crystal, removed early that morning from the dog's misbehaving mouth, tells me she knows her turn is coming. And unlike the boy with his finger in his nose, she will be high-heeled and ready for it. <laughs> Here at the Copa. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time as a kid uh, writing letters that I would never send to anyone. Uh, we still talk about letters that we swear we're going to send and never send and never write. Uh, most of them, at least the young ones, made them into uh, this poem. Letters unsent. Dear M, you thought you were alone in the bathroom, but I saw you. From then on, the tears were mine and spanned a decade. Dear Y, one day I will stop keep keeping track of who called last, but not today. Dear H, I will answer your knock, knock, na knock, knock, with a knock, knock, every time you road trip unannounced to my door. Dear H, yes. <laughs> Dear D, yes. <laughs> Dear S, I'm gone and sorry and no longer your albatross. Dear Kay, I was the one who stood in the rain, blamed you for things you could not control. I wanted you to control everything. Dear L, you should know I didn't know, I, you should know I couldn't tell the difference between you and me then. I didn't know the difference until you left and I was left with the me I thought all this time was me but really was you. <laughs> I want to crawl into your room, shrined like you are dead and still 17. Crawl into the crawl space behind your bed and search for the strands. Dear M, you 
are beautiful in all the ways you cannot understand, all the ways you cannot starve away. Dear B, you win. <laughs> Dear E, I want you to pick up my secrets again, the ones you dropped, the ones I left on your pillow, the ones I never used to have. Dear O, I remember the look on your face. You thought I was there to cheer. It didn't occur to you that I came to play. It didn't occur to me that I wouldn't. I didn't understand at the time why you invited me or left the frog's dissected tongue in my locker. P.S. That swish remains the sweetest three-point shot of my life. Dear N, PV and J in the flatbed of your truck in the shadow of the sand dunes is the best last memory of anyone ever. Dear I, when I said maybe what I meant was never in this lifetime. <laughs> Dear W, when you stood outside my window all trench coat and boom box, I didn't want to let you in. I wanted to let you in. I hid so I wouldn't have to decide whether or not to let you in. Nothing changed in our lives, but it would have made for a great story. Dear P, he and I were together in the shower when you used your key, ate at the kitchen table, cleaned your crumbs, and left. Perhaps I should have told you. Dear S, it wasn't for love or money. Dear V, it wasn't at all like the movies. It wasn't at all like I pictured. Dear S, I'm almost done. Be patient. Dear C, there is no letter for you. I've said it all. Dear S, it's over now. Can I come home? Dear S, please. Dear G, I told you so. Dear R and J and Z, it may not have been all about you, but it has all been for you. Dear S, even on the days we do not understand each other, even on the days our letters go undelivered, even on the days ghosts are in our stead, even then I will come home to you and empty my pockets on the nightstand. Lingerie in a young marriage <laughs> is a fantasy, a request, sometimes an insult, a demand. Is this what you want from me? Perhaps you should have made yourself clear earlier. And I would never, or a dream on. It is a gift from and for him, an offering. Lingerie at 43 is a compliment. I want to see you and the cellulite of our lives in this lacy thing. You've still got it, girl. Jiggle be damned. In year 19, bring on the lingerie that all these years I've turned away. For the world, at the end of this poem sits no apology, no retraction, no change of heart, because the art of this poem lies in its irreproachable truth that I would trade it for the world. I would trade it for a weekend or a month in Paris with my husband. Come on, baby, let's go. Or maybe no husband. I would fly to the Mississippi Delta and spend a spring like Huck a-fishing and a-running. Or maybe a tiny apartment in the city, Bayou Beach, where I wouldn't talk to anyone or wash my clothes. Closs, toss the calendar, telephone, TV, wait, keep the TV. I'll watch sappy one-hour dramas with cigarette-smoking whores who curse and have topless conversations. Like Helen the Brit, who buried her father, quit her job, and turned her house into a one-way ticket around the world. We met in Alaska with no commitment, no children, and no electricity but our own. She came by way of grief and African safari, I by white picket fence. No matter. We both ended up in an old mining town haunted by the ghosts of those who could not stay. 
We spent one night in the midnight sun, dancing on the breath of a glacier, knowing we would never meet again. In the morning, she would continue west, and I would board the first flight home to make babies to whom I will not apologize. Not interested in balancing adventure with laundry, I hope when I die they will not see sadness in this poem, but the possibility of the world. Thank you.